Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me for this, uh, for what uh, we're going to do right now, which is uh, contrary to the popular advice that you get out there. Uh, so don't tell people that you wrote your own crypto. It's just, uh, just for your own safety. Because uh, the reason being is when you uh, rule your own crypto, there's a lot of uh, potential for mistakes, bugs, uh, money at stake sometimes, or security. So this is not what you should do, and it's the easiest way to lose money. But the reason why we're doing this is so that we can learn a thing or two about how these things work, with an understanding, and uh, hopefully also uh, improve uh, our uh, understanding of blockchains, uh, communication protocols, and so on. So uh, we are going to learn a little bit about cryptography in specific, and uh, the signature scheme that we are going to learn about is known as set v 2 this k one And for those who are wondering why is it worth learning about it, that, that's what's used in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and pretty much every blockchain on there. Uh, if you scan uh, this QR code, you visit the same uh, uh, book, so you can uh, follow along. There's some, going to be some code samples that we will try on uh, hosted Jupyter notebook, or if you have Python installed locally, that also works. So a little about me, my name is uh, Anu. I'm a staff engineer at Ray. I do wallet stuff. And uh, I can assure you that the crypto that we wrote today is not part of our wallets, but that's more of a toy implementation. Okay, so if you use Brave Wallet, your coins are secure. Uh, okay, let's start. Can we confirm if you we are able to visit the page, or should I go back to the QR code? So what is the uh, like, cryptography? Uh, it is based on the concept of cryptic curves, where you see what they look like, uh, and they are defined by finite fields, which we also study in the For those who are familiar with RSA, it has a similar intent. It does something quite uh, pretty much the same, but it does it more efficiently. So when you use the key, uh, in the electric cryptography, the size is going to be a lot smaller, which is really useful for uh, cryptocurrencies, where uh, you're supposed to use smaller keys to so have efficient and compact uh, of the keys to share over the wire. Uh, if you use PGP, uh, you use normally RSA. Uh, so to crack, such a PGP key, you will have to spend as much energy as to bring the Mediterranean Sea to Okay, That's a lot of energy. But typically, with the uh, uh, 6 bit and uh, cryptography key, uh, which is used in a lot of these crypto wallets, uh, the amount of energy that you have to spend to crack this is apparently you have to bring all the water and all the water. So that's a lot of energy. Uh, so if you think for a key size that's pretty small. So 256 bits versus 2048 bits in case of answer. Uh, last time I checked, if you visit google.com, you can just uh, uh, click on this dot icon, and you can see uh, exactly which uh, Digital signatures are used behind the scenes to secure your HTTPS connection. Uh, Edge.com was using RSA, so the large key size. Google.com was using a curve known as set 256 r one So also 256 bits, but a different curve than what we're going to uh, study today. Um, so, so without saying, ECC is more secure for uh, 
smaller key size, which is four hundred times more security than uh, I would say for a key that's eight times smaller. It's really efficient, and it's pretty hard to break this as per current knowledge. I can't guarantee this, but that's what the cryptography is. We have to put these algorithms to the test of time and hope that we don't do it. Uh, if you use that because uh, the difficulty of breaking these algorithms also increases. Uh, by the way, it was branded as military grade technology. They had back in the day, I don't know when, but maybe 1980s, technology uh, was part of the United States munitions list. So one of the technologies that you could not export outside the United States. So what we are studying today is military grade. And that's what a typical elliptic curve looks like. Um, they have a general equation, which is uh, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Uh, as you can see, because of the y squared component, it is symmetrical along the x-axis. So it's like a mirror unit. Imagine the x-axis is a mirror. So one of the same stuff uh, above and below. And then you have a cubic component of x plus ax plus b. a and b are constants. So yeah, you can play with, you can probably pull up what from that far, you know, play with different values for A and B and get different shapes of the curves. So I uh, have some pictures for you uh, with different values of A and B, you get different shapes, but not all of them are useful. So you have to really carefully select these values so that we can be of use for the cryptography. Um, there are many different families of elliptic curves. The one that we are going to talk about is known as Weistrass curves. Uh, it's a bit hard to pronounce, so I have an easy way to remember this. I call it a turtle curve. So this is the second one. It looks like a turtle. Uh, you have other curves that look like starfish, uh, that's our Edwards curve. Uh, and then you have squid curves and what appears to be a stingray. So you have different kinds of curves, but this is the one, the second one is the third one, is what we are going to talk about. It's used in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Zcash. And starfish is used in uh, Stellar. Anyways, uh, in reality, I actually lied that this is what an elliptic curve looks like. In reality, it looks something like this. Why? Because uh, they're defined over what's known as a finite field. You can understand that means. But there are a finite number of points that would satisfy your elliptic curve equation. So there are dots all over the place. But what you can probably see is that there's still symmetric control over the x-axis. It's important point. Uh, some more uh, exotic curves that have totally use this, but in case uh, I want to play with them, uh, I create with them on uh, one thing. Uh, and uh, one of the properties that we're going to also look at in the next uh, segment is uh, if you take any two points on a practical elliptic curve, you'll always find a third point where there's an intersection. So this is a simple example of that. So if you take P and Q, there would be another intersection. It's not a point in the curve. Cool. And we are going to do that in Python. Uh, the reason being uh, the math that we are going to do is over 256 bits. Not a lot of languages support that data. Uh, so Python has that. Uh, every number is pretty much unbounded. And it has some useful uh, methods to do certain math operations that you're going to look at. 
apply a modulo using the fields drawing number and get a value that stays within the bounds of uh, the zero uh, So we that we have that for addition, subtraction, uh, scalar, multiplication. Uh, it's just the same formula but different operators. Uh, so multiplication of two field elements, multiplication of a scalar with a field element, uh, they're all the same. Um, we also have a power, so we can uh, raise a field element to a power. So we just use this operator that Phantom provides. Uh, it's useful when you're dividing something, uh, one field element with the other, uh, because it's the same as multiplying with an inverse of a field element. So we have an implementation for that as well. So if you divide one element with another, it's basically getting the inverse and then doing the So just with all this, we now have our ground field uh, and field elements ready. Uh, I'm going to copy this entire code and paste it in the notebook. And I'll go that it works. Okay, it works. Okay, so far, uh, nothing fancy, just some additional things and questions. So in my case, um, remember what I said that an elliptic curve has an equation, x squared equals uh, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So we are going to do exactly that. So we define an elliptic curve here. And here and the constants that belong to the uh, specific to the curve. And every elliptic curve is defined over a finite field. Um, so I also, um, in fact, it would be at this point uh, interesting to draw this study one. This is your x and y axis. So let's say this is our elliptic curve. And uh, the equation is y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So all you have to do is define A and B and have different kinds of curves. Uh, so this is what you see in the class A and B. Um, there's also a contains definition, which is how would you know if a certain point exists on the curve? So that's pretty straightforward. So if you take any point which has an X and a Y, uh, the way you would know that it lies on the curve is if it satisfies this equation. So that's what we do. So y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. If this is true, then the point lies on this curve. Uh, there's some other not very useful stuff going on here. It's just doing some validation where uh, when you initialize a and b, Creating instances of, of the uh, class that we just created. So I'm going to also copy that and paste it here. One. I think it works. So we have a class for the elliptic curve, and now finally we can define the curve that's used by Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it is known as set p 261 Don't be afraid of the name. It's just a fancy way of defining what uh, it, uh, just representing what it's about. So SEC is not Gary Tesla's organization. It's standards for education in uh, P uh, is just like a delimiter that says everything that follows P are the parameters. 
the uh, field style is two characters in space, which means any number like A and B on the curve, those are two characters in space numbers. These are just integers, nothing fancy. K means, uh, stands for a complex curve, which means basically that it's not a random curve, that the parameters are not chosen randomly. There's a construction And uh, I guess there's a sequence number which means uh, conversion. So, set P256 K1. Set P256 K1 has the general equation as y squared equals x cubed plus 7. So A is 0 and B is 7. So if we put these numbers in our class and uh, instantiate it, then uh, we get our set B to 6 k one So A is 0 and B is 7. And it's defined over a field with a prime number that is this. So in Python, it's pretty easy to like, like set a similar number. So so who came up with this? I don't know. Uh, maybe the SEC. <laughs> but this is what we all used to do. So that's how we call it. We will copy that and paste it. Yep. Perfect. One minute. So there you go. We have a curve. What are we going to do about that? So the curve in itself is not useful unless you define certain operations that you can do on top. For example, when you have a clock, it's useful because we know what those uh, numbers mean. And you can do some math with it. You can say four hours from now is going to be five p.m. Stuff like that. So we need something like that. Um, recall that I talked about a point, uh, it's with x and y, so let's uh, write some code for that with uh, exactly what I just uh, explained as an x and y, uh, it's over a curve, because we have to say what is the curve on which uh, these points lie, and it's just doing some validation is the point in the curve. Normally it should be, right? So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to put it here. By the way, one cool trick is so x and y are two interesting big numbers. Those are really large numbers. So one way to save on space is if you uh, because these curves are symmetrical over x-axis. So you just store the, uh, the x value and you store a sign that says whether it belongs to, whether it's positive on the y or negative on the y. Uh, so that's one bit. So you use, you are like, in two pictures, seven bits, you can represent a point exactly on the curve. You want to save space. For example, if you're doing a Bitcoin transaction where you're paying for the size of your public keys. Uh, so it's good to save some space there. Lower the keys. Okay, so this is what I explained now. This, this technique is known as point compression. All right, so the one you what do we do with this curve in the uh, I'm going to talk about another, this is the only other mathematical part of this workshop, and it's known as group theory. And you'll now understand why uh, learning about this is uh, essential to understanding the group curves. So group, like the name suggests, is a group of elements. And along with these elements, you have to define one operator. In this case, it's a one plus operator. And it has a certain uh, number of properties. 
For example, if you take two elements of a group, the result would also be in the group. Uh, if you uh, have these kind of properties of associativity, where if you add uh, two elements and then add it to the third element, You add the last two elements and then add it to the first two. You have an identity, which means uh, which means every group has an identity element in it, to which if you add any other element, it will well, be as good as adding nothing. And finally, you have uh, an inverse for any element. So why are we talking about groups? Because the elliptic curve that we just drew is a group. So now what does that mean? So it means that it has a closure property since this whole elliptic curve is a group. So all these collection of points are part of the group. If you add any two points, the result would also be another point in the group on the elliptic curve. Uh, there is somewhere something known as an identity, which is a point, and uh, we can have the inverse of the property as well. So, for every point, there is uh, inverse of that point, which also does in the curve. Uh, and one interesting property of curves like these. Uh, which have a prime few is that if you take any point and if you add uh, add a uh, point to itself, we'll talk about what that means. Then you can generate every other point on the curve. That's kind of it's strange, but I don't know why that works, but it does. So that's known as a generator point. In fact, every point is a generator point. You take this point, you add, you double the point by adding it to itself, and you can get, and if you keep doing that, you can derive every other point in this group. Is that because it's in the point here, or does it work in Sorry? Is that because it's in the prime field? It doesn't work on any field. Uh, it doesn't work on any field. In fact, uh, and skip the like a definition bit is the groups have to also satisfy uh, the commutative property. So A plus B is same as B plus A. Uh, we'll actually check this property uh, on paper. But if a group exhibits this property, then uh, you can generate every point of the curve from a single point, which will be also in the Um, so, uh, that's why when you have a group, which is Z, you can represent it uh, like this, G, 2G, 3G, 4G, the repeated additions. Uh, so let's, let's try to define this now, because we had our point uh, class already. So, these values are what defined in Bitcoin and Ethereum. So it's the same guy who came up with the curve also came up with these generator points. So it has an X, it has a Y, and it lies on the set P256 Q1. And uh, by the way, uh, these groups are also cyclic, which means uh, you keep adding stuff on this Group, then eventually it's cycling and it'll reach back to the same point. So it's a finite number of points, it's not an infinite group, and you can uh, move from one point to another by adding uh, the point to itself. Uh, so, just one question you use integers here, right? So, yeah, that means all that integers. Yeah, that, that there should be points rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. So, curve, right? Right. So, X and Y are integers, but this as a whole is a point. So when I was saying that, and uh, did I mention that 
yeah, I, I, I think I mentioned that these points are elements of the group, the curve being the group. So what does it mean to add two points? That's what we're going to see next. But that's a great question. But they are all uh, regular integers. They're just normal. Nothing that points to work. So we're going to copy that. So this is defined by um, not Satoshi, but the guy who came up with this code. Or maybe Satoshi came up with the uh, Rani It could be any Rani, but I don't know why uh, Satoshi chose this particular set of numbers. This so curve was not chosen by Satoshi. It was by the person who started that. Yeah, in 2000. And it's it? No. <laughs> It was like some Japanese standardization organization or some shit. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm going to copy this and uh, just going to reuse the same definition that we had for the point. Plain numbers. Um, so now we are going to address the point that you raised is what does it even mean to add two points? So this is what it means. It has a special meaning. So remember uh, the opening part of the workshop, uh, I said that there is a property in these elliptic curves where if you uh, take any two points, you'll always find a third point that is on the curve where it intersects. This is a property. And what it means to add two points is basically you find the intersection at the third point, so this is also another x in there. And you take, uh, you just negate the y component of it to get a mirror image. And this is p1 plus p2. So, you want to try with any other point? Let's add, uh, let's add these two points, right? So this one and this one. So it should normally intersect maybe here. So that's the third point of intersection, and you reflect it along the x-axis. So that is the addition of P2 and P1 plus P2. Let's call it P4. Which is P1 plus P2. So if you think it's the wrong one, right. you, you intersect with the line and not with the curve. So, sorry, I intersected the... With the line and not the curve. No, yeah. P4. No. Uh, no, so, I mean, this extends to the infinity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The top of the top P4. It should go further up to the curve. To the curve. Oh, the curve. oh, yeah. OK. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good match. <clears throat> That's how we add points. So uh, this is just the uh, same thing as an image. Uh, you extend to the third point that's the negative of p plus q. So if you negate uh, it along the x-axis, you get p plus q. Uh, I found this uh, nice uh, animation from Cloudflare's blog. Uh, we found that I, I mentioned once that this is a, this is fake. It's it's not how elliptic curves look like this for our understanding. In reality, there are a fixed number of points that you can have on the elliptic curve. So uh, this reflects the reality of it more. So uh, it's trying to add A and B. And what it means is you draw a straight line. It wraps along because of the prime module. And then you keep doing that until there is a point that you can directly. If it is the case, it's going to be this. So, 
if you keep adding uh, like this, you would eventually hit all the points on this kind of, uh, on, on this uh, group elliptical. That's fake as It's so strange. You cannot predict so it's like a... exactly. And you uh, actually that's the cool thing about elliptic curves is you cannot predict just by looking at A and B where it's gonna hit. You have to follow the lines and make sure you arrive at a point where there is an intersection. So how to how to implement that? Uh, so in our previous point class, uh, we are gonna override certain methods like add. Um, and there is also yeah, there's just add. In the next slide, we'll also add one to point. So how how is this working? Um, so there are different cases. Uh, let's take the case of, uh, I, I'm going to do a new page, just for addition. Yeah, we already defined the identity. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I was going to do. Okay. Um, so uh, I keep talking about this identity uh, element in the group, so there exists an identity. And uh, if you if you see the point class again, you will see that there is an optional integer. So when x and y are none, or empty values. Uh, that's how we represent identity in code. And you, you're going to see what it means in uh, yeah. Identity is also known as point at infinity. So when there is, a, when there is no intersection, you say that it intersects at infinity. And that's your identity. OK, so. Uh, so for different cases, uh, just implementing the addition. So what happens is uh, you're adding uh, a point to identity. Uh, it's going to be the point itself. So, uh, which is uh, from the group loss. Uh, what happens if you uh, add a point to its editor inverse? I mean, from plain math, it makes sense. But we're going to see if it makes sense on on the graph as well. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, let's um, do that. So, if there is a point B, and let's take a minus B, they're not going to intersect anywhere at the third point. You can, you can draw a line, but it's not going to intersect in there. So what we say is it does intersect at infinity, which we denote it as i. So p plus i and i plus p cases just return the appropriate value. Uh, this I, I just showed you the case for the inverse. Okay, what happens when the regular case, you have a point here, A, and you have another point here, B. How do you get the third point? Well, it's not that complicated. You draw a line like that. You try to find the intersection. How do you find that? By getting the slope of the straight line. And once you know the slope, you can uh, Replace it in the equation of multiple curves and get the third point. So, y2 minus y1 minus y2 minus x1. That's the slope. Uh, I am not going to uh, go through the math, but um, 
you just get a slope and you place it in the actual uh, equation. And yeah, that's that basically what we're doing. How do you add a point to itself? Uh, okay, uh, so actually before that I should cover a vertical tangent. So at this point, So it's it's not an intersect with any other form at all. Uh, but we just say that it's an infinity. So these are the various edge cases that we are covering. And finally, this is the more interesting one. If you have a point like here, how do you add it to itself? So uh, what does it even mean? So if I picked any other point, it would be easy to get the slope, find the intersection, and get the addition. But what if I want to have a x? What if I want to do a x plus x? So the way you do that is you try to get a slope at this point by doing a differentiation of the curve, and then basically the same thing. So this is a tangent because it's a single point. And then you get the uh, slope through differentiation and replace it in the equation. I've already done that. Trust me, this is what you will get. Uh, and then I return the, the right values. So point and infinity is just this. It's a hypertension point where uh, it's a third point of intersection that never happens. And this is how we define it. I think I'm probably going to go to the code. Okay. Uh, let's also copy this whole code and paste it. So what have we covered so far? Uh, we covered what is elliptical cryptography. Uh, any number in the world of elliptical cryptography is defined in a finite field. Those finite fields are of prime size. They are all numbers, even the size. The numbers inside the prime field are all two to six bit numbers. Uh, we define an elliptic curve, which is just a set of all such points, point being equal to uh, numbers, like x and y, that fit the uh, equation. And we also discussed some properties uh, about elliptic curves uh, that allow us to do cool stuff like addition. And we implemented that in Python as well. Cool. Uh, Addition is actually not the interesting operation that we need for cryptography. We are gradually moving, building towards what's actually used for signatures, and that is multiplication. In fact, multiplication is not that hard once we already figured out how to add, because uh, recall that every elliptic curve is just a set of these elements. And this is cyclic. You start from any point, let's call it, let's call it this one G. Start from there, you get EG, which is G added to itself. Maybe this is 2G, I don't know. Let's say this is 2G. Um, you get 3G by adding G and 2G, maybe it's somewhere else. Uh, maybe this is 4G. You keep doing that. And the idea is that once you uh, would have multiplied uh, n number of times, n being the point at which it becomes cyclic, 
then you can add G. So G and uh, yeah, uh, algebra and show that. So uh, you take a loop and you just keep adding the points to itself, and that's how that's how you get a uh, multiplication. So if you want two G, you just do a G plus G. And if you want uh, 15 G, you do that 15 times. It's pretty inefficient. There are more efficient ways of doing that, which is something that I'll show you. It's a, it's a technique known as binary expansion, but even if you use the naive loop approach, that also works. You'll get the same results. Uh, okay, so let's try to uh, let's try to be uh, I'll I'll add the multiplication logic in my point class. which makes sense, but you cannot do the other way around. You cannot reverse, you cannot go from a public key, reverse this operation, maybe try to figure it out with brute force, and, and find out what E was, what, which E was used for creating that public key. And all wallets, hardware wallets, software wallets, even HTTPS connections, they all rely on the difficulty of reversing this multiplication. And it's, it's easy to verify from, if you have an E, you can prove that you own the E, but you can't do the other way around. And, and by the way, um, hardware wallets and especially uh, devices that rely on, uh, that need fast computation, they are not doing a simple multiplication, they are doing it in a more efficient manner. So you can do it in less time and so on. But, this is the basic underlying concept. Just a question. So this critically depends on the value of G, right? Because suppose that we chose another generator for the group, we would have 
correct, they would be able to arrive to the same P. Then no. Uh, that's the point, you know. It doesn't matter which G you choose, you just, you just end up with a new problem key. But you can still yeah. deterministically arrive at it. Yeah. And all of us have to agree to the G that we want to use. G can be anything. Yeah, but yeah. everyone has to use the same Everyone has to use the same G. That's the idea of standardizing this in a thick code. But as developers, as users of this Bitcoin is the largest public deployment of elliptic of cryptography, of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and blockchains. Right? So we, we should be suspicious of the value that was chosen for G, because maybe the guy who did it, or the people who did it, the organization, maybe they have figured out a way to back them. For them, they can arrive at, uh, they can do this operation more efficiently. Uh, because of the G that they chose? Uh, not really, because uh, NG big, uh, like if uh, the electric curve fit what we're in Poland, if, if the one G could be also the other G. So you should not be suspicious of generator, but should, you should probably be suspicious of BND. perhaps A, B, and P. Right. Yeah, the, the prime. Yeah, but not G. Yeah. G is full. Oh, but it, it, <laughs> it is full, but okay. okay. So you have to be suspicious of the curve that you use. Yeah. And any two competing curves may not have the same security properties. Yeah. But if G is uh, completely irrelevant, why is it not a prettier number? Let's say. Because <laughs> uh, it needs to be on the curve. There is like yeah, um, yeah. history on, I would say the form of history they like go on. Well, yeah, but my, my point there was uh, in the... Actually, we kind of asked the same question in 2015, I think, on that work of... So my point there was that uh, even though G could be any point, in the paper that describes that P to 56 K1, the curve, they have not really uh, explained how they arrived at the number G. Like why this particular number and not something else. There's just lack of information. Right? And uh, that's it. I mean, we should all be suspicious of them. But uh, I think this is one of the curves that has stood the test of time. So not only the attacker is only pretty old uh, to make use of it. Okay, cool. Uh, so we also did uh, multiplication. So this is, uh, we have our first useful operation already from a private key, how we work the problem. In fact, let's also appreciate the simplicity of this. This E is your private key, is just a number. All your wallet is doing, uh, your favorite wallet, right? could be a hardware wallet. All they're doing is securely uh, keeping this a secret. That's their main task. And the other important task that they ask is to do this operation in a way that doesn't leave uh, your key. Is, is any number valid? Any number is valid. Three. That could be yeah, yeah. just three. Could be any number. Five million three hundred twenty-five. It can be zero. It cannot be zero. That's between one and the um, the order of the of the of the of the number. So like how yeah. many times you go to the point? Of this point this maximum. this yeah. Um, so it starts with number and one G. So it's a one is a number. But you shouldn't probably use one because everyone knows number is. It's a uh, one is not a good private key, but uh, no, no, random no, six base number is more than good private key. Must be more than good. Okay. okay. Which brings us to the uh, to the final part of uh, this workshop, which is uh, how do we leverage this operation to produce signatures when you submit a transaction to the Ethereum blockchain. You have a message, and you want to prove that you own a certain private key holding funds. 
and that's uh, the arcing card that you generate uh, to, to deliver this proof is known as a signature. So uh, some smart guys uh, came up with an algorithm, and they call it elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, uh, which is uh, basically a set of formula. But it all uses it all uses the uh, same scalar multiplication on an elliptic curve. Uh, so how do you how do you produce a signature? So first you need a value. So you get your value and compute your power key. Second, you need uh, another random secret, which is not your private key, but it's, it should change for every signature. Uh, let's call it K. And you do the same thing. You try to get the public key associated with K if it were a private key. It's called R. So this is supposed to be random. K is supposed to be a random number every time. So R, which has an X and a Y, because it's a point, uh, that's like your random, uh, yeah, a random number that belongs to the curve. And then once you have these two things, uh, you can get your signature with this formula, which is, uh, let me write, here, it stands in the signature, which is, by the way, also a number, is going to be something like Z plus R E times K inverse. So it's by K, but that's times K inverse. What is Z? Z is your message. So you take your message, it could be as long as you want, you hash it to a 256 bit number, not 256, but do it as many times as you want. Uh, so Z is your hashed message. R is, uh, small r is the X component of your random point. E is your private point. And K is, uh, this random scalar that you use to generate the random point. And, and by the way, uh, this, uh, the task of a good wallet is to not just generate really private numbers or private keys, but to also produce efficient randomness, that is really random, truly random. You no, know, you, you can't possibly do a Math dot run on JavaScript and use that for your model. But uh, yeah, you should use that kind of completely bulletproof implementation of randomness if you want your signature to be secure. Cool. So you just do that again. Uh, this is also uh, where you produce a number. You give this number and your message to the Ethereum blockchain, and it's going to validate your transaction. Uh, actually, the, it's not, I, I assume you would be talking about like sheet random and presentation three. Yeah. 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 So, uh, we'll, uh, in, in, in the next section, we'll, we'll study what happens when you don't choose a random number. What if, you, what if you use the same random number or something that, yeah? What happens to K? Is it garbage? It's not garbage. I mean, uh, you throw it away after Yeah, you throw it away. You're supposed to throw it away after you're done with your signature. All right. But what happens if you don't throw it away and you reuse it for another signature? That's something that PlayStation, Sony PlayStation did for signing updates to their firmware. So we're going to see what, what could happen in that case. Um, so, I just uh, created a class called private key. You have your E as a private key. I'm using branding of hyphen, which should not be used for production concurrently, but uh, I just complete this. So, for those who are 
who uh, have worked at the lower level on wallets, you would know that when you produce a signature, there is an R and an S. So there's a B and an R and an S. So the S is this, and the R is uh, the X component. So you're supposed to provide this to whoever you want to verify that the signature is valid. OK, so let's see if this works. Uh, I'm going to copy this code. Uh, let's switch to Well, um, I'm missing a signature clause. So your signature has an R and an S. That's what you have. And then you can verify the signature given your message and your public key corresponding to your private key. Because you should be able to prove that you know the secret. Otherwise, you couldn't have possibly generated the signature. OK. Uh, this works. And I just wrote a couple of uh, test cases for creating a signature and very fun. So I'm going to copy all that. And uh, okay, so um, you see that I've defined a public key here. And uh, I, have, I have my message, which is hash of my message. Of me. Just some parameters that if I pass it to a very high function, it's going to say, yeah, it's, it's all right. And this works. So you can uh, imagine that if you're trying to sign an Ethereum transaction or any message uh, on your wallet, then this is roughly what is happening behind the scenes. So, um, he uh, pointed out something interesting, uh, which is uh, the security of this whole algorithm stays as long as two things. One, you have really kept your private key private. Because if you know your, uh, if someone knows your private key, then uh, this is going to be able to, the signature is public, and your R is also public. So you know this. Then you can uh, you can forge signatures on behalf of the user in future, and we don't want that. But in addition to that, the security of ECDSA also relies on the fact that the random number. So we use a random scalar key to get a random point, and small r, lowercase r, is the x component of that. We need this number to be really current and really random. And by random, I mean uh, you have to use it for a signature and forget about it. Never use it again. If I'm an attacker and I find out that some wallet is using Python's random, how happy am I? Like, how much easier does it make my job? Um, well, uh, the thing is, it, it, it depends where you're executing the Python code. If, if, if the Python interpreter is in an environment where the hardware is touched, that it doesn't generate random randomness, then this thing becomes kind of easy to guess. And uh, we'll see why it allows attackers to uh, steal your funds. Right, I guess I'm just trying to ask that. What's the difference between like Pseudo randomness and actual randomness because I think there are yeah, yeah. things like zero randomness. Right, so um, I can tell you, uh, I'm not a good authority in speaking about uh, how how good a random randomness algorithm is going to be, but I'm aware of there being uh, labs, certification labs, that perform statistical tests on uh, your source of randomness. Like some people say that okay, if I roll dice, uh, it's going to be it's a it's a good source of randomness. Uh, I have enough number of uh, dice, 
but you, your, your diet would always be loaded and you wouldn't know how. Mm. Um, I mean, it's just a very weak source of animals. And any point you involve a human to do that at any step, that's not a good way to reduce climate. I'm, I'm aware of some uh, APIs that look at the atmospheric uh, weather information and stuff like that to produce randomness, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if there is a mathematical proof saying that this is indeed random. It is not possible. It, it's a research topic in itself. Yeah. Yeah. So your K has to be random and secret. Why? Why is that? Uh, in fact, it, it's kind of pretty obvious if you think about it. So, uh, and this is what happened with uh, Sony PlayStation. So let me go, go to, the, to this section. So, uh, you should not have a random, a source of random like this, uh, like this. Um, ideally, it should be something that's hardware generated, uh, either on a laptop machine, hardware one that's hardware, two random numbers in the So, uh, so I, I don't recall when it was this, sometime in the 2000s. Uh, they used a private key to sign, uh, to do a PC signature uh, for signing their firmware update. Right. So, if you, uh, the signature is valid, only then the firmware will be updated. And while this uh, private key that was used to sign these firmware updates was super secure, kept in an HSN, uh, the randomness that was used for the algorithm, and this was a programming error more than something that you know, had the leverage on the hardware. So they forgot, in their implementation, they forgot to keep the key value random. So they reused the same value for every signature. And what someone figured out is, uh, um, if you want, you can do the math uh, yourself. But what someone figured out is they took two different signatures. So let's say you have uh, let's say you have one signature. So the fact that took one signature, let's call it S1, normally for the signature R should be random. Uh, let's call it. Yeah. But in this particular case, uh, this attack waited for another signature to appear from Sony, and let's call it S2. So S1 is a normal. It's just a simple normal. S2 is also a normal. And these two signatures are different. But in Sony's implementation, they forgot to keep R1 different and random. So R1 was same as R2. And uh, even though the private keys were different, that was not done. The reason being, everything else are public figure, public numbers. So if you divide these two equations, you would, you would find S1 by S2 equals, so uh, if you keep your same uh, random number, then R1 is R2, K1 is also K2, because K times G equals So the x part of the r point is the smaller. So if you keep the same randomness, then k would also be the same because this operation is deterministic. So if you divide these two, 
they will cancel out each other. And the equation turns out to be Z1 plus RE1 by Z2 plus RE2. S1 is public, it's just a simulation. S2 is public. Z1, Z2 are your messages. So you could be even signing two different messages, but it's a public number. E1 is private, uh, but if R component is the same, then uh, you could do a substitution uh, in, uh, in this overall equation. And it will be easy to figure out what was the private key that was used to do this. Uh, yeah, but so that's uh, that's an exercise I need you guys to to do. Uh, just substitute uh, this thing in the original S one equation, and we'll end up with something. That's my methodology, which means uh, you can figure out your unknown parameter, which is the private key from one. OK, so I would like to conclude here by saying that if you follow my advice and roll your own crypto on production, then uh, I think that's not a sound thing to do. Uh, because even if you keep E and K private and random, uh, you can still figure out, uh, just from this multiplication operation, uh, what K was used to, uh, uh, to arrive at this R. And the way that works is through sophisticated hardware like this. Um, so uh, this is just a way to uh, overview, but the idea is that every time, so this is repeated additions of G to itself. So every time you do an addition, the electronics could be sending out some kind of uh, heat signature, some kind of uh, electromagnetic waves that if you observe it, you would know how many times, how many times it should add G to itself. Okay. So uh, that's even possible with other ones. Um, to most hardware wallets, which is why uh, you should never leave your hardware wallet on a coffee table and go to the toilet thinking that, hey, you know, no one knows the pain and 24 words. Uh, but if you have physical access to even 90% of hardware wallets, you can, you can uh, try to observe uh, the multiplication and see, figure out the P or the E. So don't roll your own crypto, uh, which goes against the title of my workshop. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, understanding how electric curves are implemented are a good way to uh, just uh, be more informed of about like, uh, not just how Ethereum works or blockchains work, but also like, it's a whole component of every te technical stuff. Uh, and it also makes you paranoid about personal security, your funds. Right? So, if you want to learn more about um, other kinds of curves, which are a bit more fun to implement, I've uh, left some links. If you're interested in cryptography, if you think after this workshop, you would like to dive into cryptography, there is a CryptoPals challenge, which is pretty popular, it's a set of challenges that you can solve and get better at this stuff. It's not just electric curves, but uh, in general. Um, and yeah, share me uh, uh, your uh, implementations in various languages. You can do pretty much on any language, uh, but I chose Python because it was That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I missed it, but what is the relationship between the private key and the K? So uh, there is no relationship. Uh, they are both uh, 
private key is supposed to be private. It's just that k is a randomly chosen uh, number that you just use for your specific uh, signature. Once you do the signature, you will show it as a new random k uh, for your next signature. So when you verify the signature, how do you know the it comes from this uh, part? Because when you share your uh, signature with the verifier, you provide the S, which is a signature, and you provide the R, which is uh, like the X, R, X. So it's case. multiplied with the verification. Yeah. Uh, okay. Not, uh, so this is a random scalar. You, uh, when you add G to itself K number of times, so you get an R. This is the R that you provide to the verifier. Um, actually, in modern implementations, they usually generate K from the message and the private key itself. So it's not random. It's like a hash. Yeah. And so this is like a proper way to do it these days. No randomness at all. Maybe you can mix randomness to the hash, but like overall, it's uh, they have a standard. It's called six nine seven nine. I will see six nine seven nine. And if you want to roll your own crypto, I strongly advise to do this. I actually rolled my own crypto, and it's uh, yeah, it's been a great challenge. Like to check it out, like check out the best JavaScript implementation, no hole. Very simple to read. We use that again. Cool. So um, they use the MetaMask. Oh, what's the name? No hole. Okay. No hole. Novel crypto, novel curves. Yeah, so uh, if you don't want to choose your random uh, uh, key, what you can just like I said, from a message and a private key, then uh, uh, you can take a value for key. And it's more secure. The RFC is known as a deterministic uh, once. Uh, so it prevents what if you reuse the value of k, the attack is known as non-reuse attack. So, um, what's the process of picking a curve? How do you determine if a curve is valid? Do you just have to create crazy call them random and see if they satisfy the axioms of the group theory? Um, so I'm not aware of uh, how uh, curves are constructed or chosen. Mm -hmm. But let's say I'm a uh, one and up uh, and uh, Mm -hmm. Some curves have different curves have different properties. Mm -hmm. For example, BS curves have properties that are more suited for uh, aggregation, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they are uh, more efficient in terms of space. Mm -hmm. um, certain operations on certain curves would be uh, faster to do versus this old uh, 20, 30 year old curve. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I think this is the most widely used blockchain that I can uh, And I, I believe uh, BLS curves are used for the one uh, for the curve. Uh, apparently, it's used somewhere in Ethereum, but I don't know exactly where the problem is. A last note from the K. Uh, it's possible for a like backdoor shitty wallet to produce a K which looks random and is not like computed, cannot be computed by anyone else, but the like owner of this wallet would know how the K is generated and they will be able to steal your funds. So, yeah, so even though it's like random, if they know its structure, it, you're screwed. Yeah, it's very dangerous. And that's exactly what uh, these statistical tests are supposed to Basically, do. draw your own wallet. Uh, <laughs> is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Statistical <laughs> tests don't, don't, don't help because it can be totally random, but it can be ge like generated for one scene. Some function or that's no yeah. yeah. yeah, uh, you said the one in the curve was a sequence number. What's, what's, what's the sequence number? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it's like the version. If there's a better version, maybe they use uh, A2 or something. Uh, but I haven't come across any curve that uses A2 or R2. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, any other questions? 
Thanks a lot. This is amazing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.